In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about PG Edge Cache, Postgres and OpenAI, Cytex to Collations, and Compression Options. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 254. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is Cache Consistency with Logical Streaming Replication. This is from shortishly.com. And what this is talking about is a new tool. So this is the tool that this blog post is talking about. So it's the PostgreSQL Edge Cache. And it's some sort of tool, utility, application that maintains a memory cache. And what feeds it is logical replication from a PostgreSQL server. And it offers three different APIs. As you can see here, it offers a memed cached API, so you can talk to it as if it's a memed cached server. It offers a REST API and a Redis API. And what makes this particularly interesting to me is that also is primarily written in Erlang, so it should be a very stable tool or application. Now, this first blog post covers this tool and says how it avoids lazy loading, because typically, you have a caching layer, and once something in the cache expires, it has to actually go through to the ultimate destination or the database to pull back more data to get recent data cached. So you have to worry about cache expirations. But with this tool that uses logical replication, it's constantly being updated from the logical replication stream. So it's essentially doing something like change data capture. And this is an in-memory cache. Nothing is preserved to disk. And he shows an example of setting it up and querying it here. The next blog post kind of repeats the same thing, but they mention the Redis API. And it also supports PostgreSQL 15's capability of using column lists and row filters to be able to filter down the exact data that you want to publish out to subscribers of logical replication. So without having to do a bunch of change data capture solutions, potentially using logical decoding, Maybe you could just use logical replication in this tool to set you up an in-memory cache that gets updated in near real time. I mean, ultimately, we will see what the interest of this tool is, but I'm really interested in seeing where this goes. And if you want to learn more, I encourage you to check this out. Next piece of content, what's Postgres got to do with AI? This is from crunchydata.com, and they're talking about using Postgres along with the OpenAI API. And it discusses the process flow here. You have some data you want to classify, and in this example, they're using recipes. So they have a whole recipe database. They want to pass it to the OpenAI API and receive back tokenized attributes, which are called embeddings, that you're able to compare to see correlations between the different items within the data. And you take these tokenized attributes or embeddings and you store them in Postgres. So to get set up to do this, you need to first install an extension called pgvector, which is actually a relatively new extension, but it helps you deal with the embeddings that you're going to be getting back from the OpenAI API. Now, for sample data, they loaded up the armed forces recipes.xml, and they have some Ruby code in here that extracted the recipe data, inserted it into this database table here, and they did queries to OpenAI to get back those vectors embeddings, and they inserted them into the database, and they kind of look like this. And then they used the following queries for doing similarity. So basically, they had a pizza recipe. They wanted to say what recipes are similar to pizza. So they use this query, finding the pizza recipe, and they say, all right, what other recipes are close to that based upon the embeddings? And then they got back a number of different recipes here, basically three different pizza ones and chicken parmesan. But they said, well, this is too much pizza, so we're going to add a not like pizza. So basically, if the pizza is in the name, they don't want that recipe. They ran it again. And now they got a little bit more variation. There's lasagna, there's eggplant, parmesan, things of that nature. And you can also query for the opposite. So what is the most opposite or what is the furthest distance from something? And they said, okay, what is the most different from a corn dog? And they basically got salads. So that pretty much makes sense. So this is a pretty brief blog post, but it shows you how you can use the OpenAI API to do correlations and comparisons between different items to see what's close to one another or far away from one another. And if you want to learn more about how to do that, definitely check out this blog post. 
Next piece of content, how to migrate from Django's PostgreSQL CI fields to use a case-insensitive collation. This is from adamj.eu. Now this is Django specific, but a lot of it covers PostgreSQL because seemingly with the new version of Django 4.2, using case insensitive text fields or CI fields or CI text fields are deprecated. So if you're using these, he says, okay, well, what's the plan? And basically you need to move to case insensitive collations of these text fields. And he goes through how to do that. Now, this is a very detailed blog post and explains a lot about what to do in terms of Postgres, but also Django as well. So if you are using CI text fields and you want to eventually move to case insensitive collations, you may want to check out this blog post. Next piece of content, more compression options for PG dump in PostgreSQL 16. This is from DBI services.com. And he's discussing that PG dump will allow LZ4 compression in addition to gzip compression. Now he didn't mention Z standard, which I know they've supported in other realms of compression, but that would be the one I would be more interested in looking at. But in this example, he compared gzip and LZ4. And basically what he found that gzip gives you better compression, but LZ4 gives you faster compressions. So if you're using PG dump, if you want faster backups, probably use LZ4. If you want the smallest size possible, you'll want to use gzip. But check out this blog post if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, unlog tables in Postgres. Is their data truly gone after a crash? This is from pganalyze.com. And this is the five minutes of Postgres episode. And we covered this blog post in last week's episode of Scaling Postgres. So this is Lucas's review on it. And he also talks about in Hacker News where there was a discussion on it and how if you don't actually start the database, the data will still be there because it's actually the startup of the PostgreSQL server that truncates the table. But someone else said, yeah, but you could have data in memory that is lost because of the crash. Again, there's no crash recovery for these tables. So you don't know what data is there, what or not there, if it's corrupt or not. So maybe you, you could retrieve some, but not much. And basically it goes back to, if you care about your data, don't use unlog tables. But if you wanna learn more, you can check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL basics, object ownership and default privileges. This is from redgate.com. And this is a very comprehensive overview of these security considerations. So if you're interested in learning more about Postgres object ownership and how the default privileges work, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, store trees as materialized paths. This is from sqlfordevs.com. And he's talking about hierarchical trees. So in the example here, he shows you have food and you have fruits that are part of that food, and you have cherries and bananas that are part of the fruits that are part of the food. So basically this type of tree structure, you should consider storing it materialized like this. The other way to store it is you store the parent once food, and then you create another record that says fruit is a parent of food, that says fruit is a child of food, and cherry is a child of the parent fruit. But he says for performance reasons, you're probably going to want to store it materialized in this fashion. And he discusses some reasons why. It shows you how you can get all the children of a particular tree leaf, as well as how to get the parents of a particular tree leaf. And his blog post does say some of the advantages and disadvantages of this. But what he doesn't talk about is actually using a materialized view. Now, there's two blog posts that cybertech and PostgreSQL.com did on the subject. The first is PostgreSQL speeding up recursive queries and hierarchical data. And here they propose storing the data in this parent-child relationship like this. But then you use a materialized view to construct those tree paths and have it look like this. So that way it's relatively easy to update the data and then the materialized view will handle re-rendering any paths. And they even did some optimization to get it performing well on queries. And their second post that covers this, the PostgreSQL L tree versus with recursive. So this digs more into the performance of this and how to handle it. So if you need to deal with some hierarchical data, I would definitely encourage you to check the original blog post as well as these two others as well. Next piece of content, announcing PG Manage 1.0a. This is from commandprompt.com. And What's happened is the OmniDB project was abandoned, but Command Prompt has taken it over and renamed it PG Manage. So this enables you to more easily manage 
multiple PostgreSQL servers from a single interface. And they highlighted the major changes that they've done to OmniDB, as well as major bug fixes, as well as UI improvements. So if you're looking for a tool like this, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL patch of interest to me, transaction timeout. This is from softwareandboost.com, and he's highlighting a patch that calls for a transaction timeout. So we have statement timeouts, we have idle transaction timeouts, uh, I think session timeouts. Well, this is addressing a transaction timeout. And they said this can be beneficial because maybe you have a long open transaction and statement timeouts aren't going to reflect that. But this could be beneficial. Now, this is ready for a committer, so nothing's happening yet. But if you want to learn more about this patch, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, ER diagrams with SQL and Mermaid. This is from cypertech-postgresql.com. And this blog post is about using, quote, Mermaid, which is a JavaScript-based diagramming and charting tool that renders Markdown-inspired text definitions to create and modify diagrams dynamically. So basically, what you see here is being rendered by Mermaid and loaded it with a Pagilla example database and generated the script where they explain the reasons that they've done it the way they've done it, and it generated this ER diagram. So if you're interested in generating something like this, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content is actually a YouTube channel, and it's Postgres Architecture Explained. Now, this is predominantly from the perspective of the different processes of Postgres, but you can check out this YouTube video out if you want. This is from Hussein Nasser. Next piece of content is also a YouTube video, and it's Postgres System Columns Explained. And he talks about CTID, Xmin, and Xmax. So you can definitely watch both of these videos if you want more video-based content. Next piece of content, Postgres Raster Query Basics. This is from crunchydata.com. Now, this was a good post, but it went a little bit over my head, given I don't use Postgres for spatial queries and analysis. But it looked like a really good introduction if I ever needed to do that to get into understanding rasters and using them. So you can definitely check out this blog post if you need to do that. Next piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FM this week. This one was on JSON. So if you want to determine whether or when you should use JSON in your Postgres database, you can definitely check out this episode or watch the YouTube video. Next piece of content, the Postgres Girl person of the week is Fritz Hoogland. If you want to learn more about Fritz and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. In the last piece of content, we did have another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this past Thursday afternoon. This one was a Ruby IDE showdown with Adrian Marin, CJ Avila, and Eric Berry. And we compare and contrast different IDEs such as Sublime Text, VS Code, Vim, and even RubyMine. So if you're a developer looking for a comparison of IDEs, definitely welcome you to check out our show. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.